Uh, to jump right into it, the project that we're going to talk about is something called an alternate reality game um, that we co-created with a group of graduate uh, students and undergraduate students, as well as professional artists in Chicago. And it was a game that was scaled for um, all the incoming students at the University of Chicago. It wasn't mandatory, so not all of the students played it. Uh, but we'll tell you more about why we did it, what it looked like, um, and what the next steps might be. So just very briefly, um, has anybody here played an alternate reality game? I know at least one, one hand of someone who played this alternate reality game, but um, how many people have heard of this genre before? Okay, higher. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so just like very, very briefly, uh, an, another, another name for this kind of game is transmedia game. So it's a game that unfolds in physical space with actors, but also unfolds online via social media, uh, emails, websites, and other forms. Uh, it might incorporate text, video, audio, phone calls, scavenger hunts, code breaking puzzles, and so forth. Um, the stories told by these games, and they're very narrative heavy, are broken into discrete pieces that players have to rediscover and reconfigure. So the narrative isn't linear. It's not like reading a novel. You're finding pieces and you're, you're putting it all together. Um, the third thing about these games is they're, they're participatory and collective. You play them with large groups. It's not like a video game, a single player video game that you're playing by yourself. You're playing with as large of a group of people as you can bring together. And finally, and this is maybe the most important part of an alternate reality game, is it has a this is not a game aesthetic. You don't tell people explicitly that they're playing a game. You give them hints that they're playing a game. You give them signs and symbols, and they figure it out. But the status of the event is constantly being renegotiated during the status uh, of the game. And we'll say more about that. Just very briefly, um, I've been working on this kind of game since about 2011 at a much smaller scale. I've worked on a number of different games. Speculation was a game about finance, for instance. The Source and Seed were games about uh, STEM education that were intended for high school students. Uh, and The Parasite is a game that Kristen and I, you know, we'll, we're talking about now uh, that we created for the first year orientation, um, along with Heidi Coleman um, and a number of different students. Um, so why turn to a game at all um, for something like orientation? Um, part of this has to do with the fact that 97% of teens now play video games or mobile games in one form or another. Uh, two, about 2 billion people worldwide play video games. Um, you know, when Grand Theft Auto uh, 5 first came out, it sold $1 billion worth of units in three days, outselling any previous movie or music product. So games are just culturally, I mean, are arguably a cultural dominant. Um, and games mean many things, right? It can mean stuff that you're playing on your screen, your big screen, your mobile screen, things that you're playing out in the world. Um, so as we were working on this game, um, we thought about learning objectives, right? So what can we embed into this game? We didn't want to make an educational game and hit people over the head with things that we were trying to teach them, but how can you take useful soft skills and incorporate them into a multi-month adventure? And I'm not going to go through all of these, but these are just some of the skills from time management to communicating clearly uh, that we were very mindful of with every, uh, every module, every challenge that we, uh, that we designed across this. Um, and, and this just gives you a sense that there's, there's a literature out there that suggests that games can be an effective form of education. So they depend on a visceral or emotional logic rather than just a cerebral cognitive way of delivering information. They garner curiosity, motivation, effort. They activate multiple learning styles, right? If you're listening to a lecture, you're getting information in one very specific way. If you're playing a game, you're hearing, you're seeing, you're interacting with animation. Um, people can come to a game in many different ways. Uh, also, and this is really important for me, uh, games enable safe failure. You can make mistakes, keep making mistakes, move through trial and error, and, and get better. Um, and that, to me, is like kind of learning 101. Um, so uh, for the remaining time, we'll give you an overview of the game. We'll talk about some of the project outcomes and qualitative data that we've uh, gathered about the, the game. And then we'll talk just a little bit about uh, kind of some theoretical implications. Great. So we'll start with talking about the parasite in detail. So as Patrick mentioned, The Parasite um, was an alternate reality game that 
uh, was designed by Patrick Heidi Coleman, who's in theater and performance studies here, and myself, along with a great group of students, staff, professional artists. Uh, we couldn't have actually done this without all of the University of Chicago kind of working with us, so it was really great. It was funded by the Neubauer Collegium. We also got help from college programming who run um, orientation, the arts, the provost's office. And we started, um, so this was, our target was first year orientation 2017, which starts in mid-September. And so we actually rolled out the beginnings of the game online in early May. And people played from May until September online. Then there was site-specific play here during the week of orientation, so September 17th through 23rd. And I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about what these different kinds of games were, but this just gives you a timeline. And I would say if we, because our target date was to roll out um, the online in May 2017, we started working on this about a year before, right? So it took um, about a year, I think, to get everything in place to make sure that this was going to happen. So we had a great team of full-time designers and performers. So this is just a list of all of the students and the professional artists that worked with us who were working pretty much um, you know, eight hours a day, to, if not more, to get this all going uh, in time for the May rollout. And our, the reason that we focused on orientation, we had certain goals about um, orientation that, you know, the university has this long orientation for first year students because it's imagined to be a moment of like key habit formation, right? That you're getting people who are coming from very different places and saying, okay, you're now all at the University of Chicago. This is what it means to be a University of Chicago student. Here's some habits, you know, here's some like, you know, ideas that we want you to have. And so we wanted to think about how we might um, help develop those goals, in particular looking at ideas about collaboration, thinking about diversity and inclusion, and really thinking about like digital media and 21st century literacies. We also really wanted to uh, work with underrepresented students to give them a greater sense of belonging at the university. And this was in response to a climate survey that the university had done that showed that first generation students, students of color, and LGBTQ students um, reported feeling alienated during orientation. That was the first moment at which they started to feel not a part of the university. And so we wanted to see if we could intervene upon that. And we also wanted it to be sort of unique and fun for everybody who was participating. So the way that it got started is what's called a rabbit hole uh, from Alice in Wonderland. So the Dean of Students who runs orientation sent out the typical letter to students saying, we're really glad you're coming, like here's some information about orientation. And this was on May 8th, 2017. And the Dean allowed us to include this little postscript at the bottom that had a little rebus puzzle, as you can see. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so the rebus puzzle had uh, a picture of a pair, the letter A, and, and a pair of eyes. And so if you typed in that URL, orientation.uchicago.edu slash parasite, it would take you to an actual website um, that had narrative information on it where you could click on links and get additional information that give you the backstory of the world that we had created. And so we had, if you clicked on these links, there was a series of redacted documents that we had created. These were all things that we created um, that were you know, the documents of a supposed disciplinary hearing between a student and a, a college dean. And we had created this whole, all these documents to, to tell the narrative of the story that we were creating. And you know, just to illustrate like that, um, not everyone, I mean, I would say a small percentage of people saw the Rebus puzzle and then figured it out. So it really just took one person to do it online uh, because they all were part of this um, class of 2020 Facebook group. And so one person was like, hey, what is this? And then it kind of started people going to try to learn more about it. And so in the focus groups, the people who played were really excited about like this entrance into the game. So one of them said, you know, whenever I used to read mysteries or any kind of story, I'd always be like, it'd be so cool if that kind of thing happened to me. And then that kind of thing started happening to me. And I was like, I guess I've got to do this now. So there was a sense among them that there was this kind of mystery that they wanted to follow, that they were being invited into something. Yeah, and, and the experience was very much like be suddenly finding yourself in the middle of a novel and finding yourself to be the protagonist of that. The story that we gave them had to do with a secret society called PS that had existed at the University of Chicago since 1896. We created fake documents suggesting that the secret society actually had existed since 1896, put those in the library and various other places. 
Um, and we basically said that PS was motivated by solving large scale social problems. So rather than hazing and doing the kinds of things that frats or sororities sometimes do, this was an organization that was committed um, to a different kind of social change. Um, the one kind of science fiction part of the story was that we said that there was a mysterious room that appeared only once every 11 years at the University of Chicago, which I will neither confirm nor deny. Um, <laughs> And, and that this was the year, this was in fact 121 years after uh, 1896, so it was 11 times 11, right, the, the kind of th the year that this was going to happen. So this was a very special moment of the appearance of the room. In the midst of this, we had many characters. Um, we had these kind of red monk characters called the Reticulites. Um, we had uh, students, including uh, Zoe, who's now a graduate student, um, playing, uh, playing characters. Uh, we had, you know, slightly more creepy characters that we can talk more about later in, uh, you know, sen sensory deprivation suits. Um, and then the, the basics of the game itself, right? So we had, there was a narrative, but then what the players are actually doing was finding 121 objects that were hidden all around Hyde Park and Chicago. And it was said that in the last time that the room had appeared in 2006, um, the Red Monks had removed the 121 objects for some reason and that the players had to find them, reconstitute them, bring them to the room in order to activate it. So it became this kind of scavenger hunt and all of the incoming players uh, came to be known as, as seekers. Um, so what we're gonna show you, uh, easier to show than tell, uh, we'll show you a brief trailer that's about two minutes long that we uh, cut after the game was done. So it's a post-mortem trailer um, and it'll, it'll give you a sense of like what this all felt like to some degree. Welcome, seekers. We are with the Sigilites in 1896, the founding members of PS discovered a room. This room contained multiple books. 121. It's appeared only once every 11 years on the University of Chicago. PS formed to protect and study the paratonic remarkable objects contained. Considerate is right. Now, 11 years of latency. Possibility to save it Possibility to save Thus, we are here to invite in a process, play scheme to you, join an assemblage of potentiality synthesizers, test, experiment. We implore you to connect with the other seekers, find these 121 objects, and return them to the room. The future of the parasite is at stake. What we're investigating, or trying to find out about on this show, and in general, is things around the PS or parasite mystery, or the Red Monks. And I wanted to ask if you've seen the Red Monk on campus. I, I have seen Red Monks on campus. The great game um, I think is the great game. Occasions. It is the I mean, greatest once, of games. It is not a must have been a few years ago, maybe 2014. It is the um, I was just walking the down the main game. quad and the greatest saw one of the corner of the, of the main quad. Uh, this must have been the main turf for the uh, tell you a story of the, the, the snow. secret society. So they tell us. We implore you to connect with the other seekers, find these objects, objects, and return them to the room. The room appears the future of the parasite is at stake. If you want to bring parts of history, for us to receive of mystery, music to each us to the region, and point us to the future iteration of the room. much time. Game on.
Okay, so we'll break some of that down. So the central question that the students were faced with is what is the parasite? They ha had these 121 objects to find. Um, and the way that they accessed this game, again, was a transmedia experience, right? So it wasn't coming at you with one screen. There were paper flyers that they found with phone numbers. And if you called one of those phone numbers, a character would actually pick up on the other end and talk to you. Uh, there were Facebook pages, Twitter uh, feeds um, that were kind of leading them into the game. Again, the word game was not being used any, anywhere early on in the process. We created a card game uh, and sent it out to all of the incoming students. Some, some of them played it, some of them didn't. Um, but we, we had a kind of like in-game session of gameplay. Um, and just to give you a sense of how deep this went, we found out that some of the students were interested in Dungeons and Dragons. And so we created, I mean really, the graduate and undergraduate students created a 35-page D&D campaign um, that looked like a real D&D campaign that was an allegory of the parasite, the very game that they were playing. So it was this kind of meta, meta, meta process. And the, some of the students actually played this game of D&D on Google Hangouts before they came to campus for the first time. So this is like, you know, nerd times three, which I love. I mean, this is, you know, like my bread and butter. Um, uh, you know, twine narratives, so like kind of interactive narratives came into this online. Um, we did some very minimal augmented reality uh, work at the Smart Museum, so we really used site-specific play. Um, you heard in the, um, the trailer a podcast um, that came out regularly about Hyde Park conspiracies that included information about the Red Monks. Um, there were uh, posters, so there was a pre-orientation course that I think 25 or 30 students took for a week. That was an actual course about new media and games, and this was all online, but hidden within that course were puzzles that led back into the game. So there was a course that, that lasted for like four hours a day, and then there were puzzles that lasted for another four hours if people wanted to do those. And they were all kind of like hidden into the, the website of the course. Um, there were puzzle chatbots that people had to like play with and crack. And you know the puzzle chatbots were one of the things that participants in the focus groups loved because this was all before they came to college, right? This is the summer before college, and so you know they would say like, "Oh, I'd like wake up, and the first thing I would do is be like, what are the bots doing? Like, what's everyone doing online while I was asleep?'" And because you know, University of Chicago has uh, many international students too, so there's always someone playing online, and so people would wake up at different times to be like, "Did someone solve something for us like overnight? Like, let me see how I can like go right." And so they were really into these like puzzle chatbots as something to do in the summer which we did not guess no. ahead of time. This was, uh, we had them apply to different sects of the secret society, playing on the kind of like Harry Potter theme. Um, somebody in the language office created a language for the, for the secret society that started circulating at the language fair, for instance. We had a fake booth with this language. Um, we circulated like over 100 pages of textual narrative documents that were kind of novelistic in nature, uh, a reading list. Uh, there were online chats among players, between players and characters. Uh, to our surprise, the players, and there were a lot of unexpected things that we can talk about during Q&A, but the players created this like 50, 70, I don't remember, page Google Doc that documented everything about the game with like links and solutions. And frequently asked questions for people who were just joining, right? That it was amazing. It was astonishing. Um, the song that you heard in the second part of the trailer was written by uh, Justine, one of the incoming students. Other students wrote songs and posted them on YouTube, uh, created original art that was related to the secret society, basically like contributed to this world. Um, there were also a lot of site-specific games. Uh, I mean, we, the name of the game was The Parasite, so we parasited our way onto a lot of other events. Um, we had a huge scavenger hunt at the Logan Center right here. There were actually events in this very room. Um, in the black box theater, uh, theater on the first floor, we created, over the course of three months, these 11 huge sculptures that were anywhere between 12 and 15 feet high, made up of books with media embedded in them. Each of the units um, had a speaker system, so you could play different audio and remix audio across the 11 sculptures. This was created by Dave Carlson and pe people in the theater and performance studies department here. Um, and, and then finally, I won't go into detail about this, but we had 11 clusters of 11 challenges each, and each of them took place in a different location around campus. So we were really trying to give the students a first impression of key sites, including the Logan Center, and also try to enchant those so that when they came back, um, uh, they would not take those sites for granted.
And so, you know, part of what we were doing in this game, like we wanted to figure out, um, you know, we had a lot of goals, we had a lot of things we hoped would happen, but first we just had to find out would people actually play this game, right? Like, was it feasible? Was it something that was like attractive to players? And so we were assessing that the whole time that we were going. I mean, we created this, you know, we built these crazy sculptures, we created all this stuff, but we didn't really know if it was going to work until we did the launch. Um, and so in order to prepare for this, um, we did do an ethnography of the 2016 orientation. So I um, trained a team of undergraduate students who went and participated in the events that the university organizes. And part of what we were looking at is what were people doing during orientation? Like what was working really well in terms of getting people to feel sort of like part of a collective? And where did we see some space where we might be able to create, you know, game events on top of it? Because we wanted to be very careful not to, you know, mess up the formula that the University of Chicago had. And there's certain things that they have to do during orientation. So we were looking for down spots, you know, like where is their time? Where, you know, where are the students sort of like getting bored that we might be able to like do some gaming of? Um, and then we did focus groups after, like two weeks after the game ended in October of 2017. And we just recruited first year students. Um, they filled out an online um, survey, a screener, and we, um, we advertised that we were looking for students to talk about what they remembered, you know, their experiences with orientation. And so we managed to get a group of people who had played the game and who hadn't played the game, which is what we were looking for in the focus groups to figure out, you know, for those who were really motivated by it, you know, what was the, the driving factor? And for those who didn't, you know, what, what was it about that? Um, and so we were able to also, you know, we had our design documents and we were able to look at, you know, the content that the players were generating as, as a form of, you know, assessment of what people were finding engaging about the game. So we did have some kind of basic idea of how many people were playing. So before they even got to school, um, we had about 611 people who had engaged like with the game, right? And that again was out of 1,700 students. Um, I would say by the time we finished, we were probably closer to eight to 900. So we got about half of the students. Um, but that's not, that's just sort of in terms of online engagement. We also, you know, most of the live events that we did had between 35 and 300 people. So like we did an event at Rockefeller Chapel that was a silent film, which I think we didn't expect would be that popular, but it was hugely popular that people were really into it. Um, and so we, you know, we got some people who had never participated online, but who kind of found it once they got to campus. And just a really quick note on engagement, that 611 isn't people coming to websites, that's 611 people who did some substantial thing, like contributed content to the game in some small way, right? I mean, we weren't, ca I mean, the, the page clicks is much higher, yeah. And so, you know, we can also sort of see what students were um, posting, right? So this was, you know, one student at the very beginning saying, I was trying not to get heavily invested into this, but now I'm heavily invested into this, right? There was a lot of discussion at the beginning of like, is this something that the university is creating or did the university's page get hacked? Like there was a lot of concern about that. Um, and so then, you know, there was sort of a sense of like, okay, fine, if the university did create this, like it's genius, right? It's working, like I'm making all these friends. And that was really like the people who really played it, by the time they got here were like, I've just made some of the closest friends I've ever had, right? That they like had made all these friends online. And you know, one of the like best parts I think of the live play was like we got to see tons of examples of people seeing each other for the first time in person and really being like, oh my gosh, it's you, which is, you know, really wonderful. Um, and you know, so I feel like you know, there was just like a palpable excitement, particularly in the summer before they got here, um, about you know, waiting to see what was going to happen next. So in the focus groups, you know, this, this did come out that people who had played said, you know, this was a really effective way of getting to know other people, right? So like they would say it started off working together on puzzles, but then it was also a social group where we talked about things and we got to know each other too. Um, and so that was really, I think, the big draw for a lot of people. Um, but, you know, I think the narrative, this is always going to be an issue with ARGs. Some people like the narrative and some people don't, right? So someone's like, I love secret societies. And the other person was like, oh, I don't know. Like, I thought it was probably too much to join up for a secret society, right? So there's, it's going to be difficult, I think, to create a narrative that has appeal for everybody. There was also sort of troubles with timing. So, you know, someone could try to participate. Like, we, we had alums in some cities, like, do things for us where they would drop off, like, a thumb drive in a Starbucks and someone would have to go find it like a CIA document drop or something. Um, and you know, so this first person had gone to look for it and didn't find it and then was kind of like, okay, well I give up, right? Um, there was a sense from some people, the ones who hadn't noticed it, 
before they got here that maybe it was too late to join once they got to campus. And so there was a sense like other, one, other people have been doing this for so long and maybe I missed out. Um, and then, you know, some people were really drawn by the story, like, um, like I dedicated my life to the parasite. And other people were like, oh, I don't know, like it, it just didn't really draw my attention, right? And I think that that's um, the sort of risk, I think, of going with something like a sci-fi narrative, right? It's going to be, or even a mystery, like for some people that's going to be a driver and for other people it's just not a genre that they find particularly interesting. And the second participant makes a, a useful distinction, I think, right? Whereas uh, we found some of this where the game sometimes grabbed people's attention but didn't keep it, right? So there were ways of, of using like viral marketing techniques to grab their attention in the first place, but because of the amount of effort required to keep going with the game, and maybe not always a clear understanding that it even was a game, which, I, you know, has benefits too, um, right? There was this kind of split. So really briefly, we're just going to do one more thing and then open it up to Q&A. Um, you know, part of the, our thinking around the design part of the, the game was that, um, you know, we have a lot of gamification these days. So gamification is the use of game mechanics and competitive procedures in traditionally non-game activities. It's a concept that comes at least in part out of behavioral economics. Um, you see a lot of examples of this, right? I mean, like your Fitbit is probably the best example. It's basically quantifying, self-quantification is one way of putting it, but it's using game avatars, points, leaderboards, badges, in order to get you interested in exercise or doing chores or getting better habits, things that you might not otherwise do. You know, and, and for me, in my own research in game studies, um, you know, I think, I make the argument that there are a lot of problems with gamification. They rely very heavily on extrinsic motivation. So they may get people to do something in the short term, but they might not stick with it. Uh, and it's also not always the most ethical way of going about a kind of uh, behavior change. And in fact, this media critic, Evgeny Morozov, I think captures um, this way of thinking of using games in order to solve problems with this concept of solutionism that he has. So he essentially he says that like when we uh, design and engineer, um, when de designing and engineering is overused, um, you, you don't get the results that you want, want. So recasting all complex social situations either as a neatly defined problem with definite computable solutions or as transparent and self-evident processes that can be easily optimized if only the right algorithms are in place, this quest is likely to have unexpected consequences that could eventually cause more damage than the problems that they seek to address. So basically he says, this is how Silicon Valley thinks about things, that there's like any, any problem has an engineering solution. That's absolutely not what we wanted to do with this game. We were not trying to solve problems. We were trying to include the players in co-creating a world, not just a fictional world, but the world of the University of Chicago that they would be a part of for the next four years. So even, um, you know, as Kristen was saying before, one of our thoughts was about diversity and inclusion at the university. Um, and even with that, it's not like we said, we know what diversity and inclusion is. We're going to engineer a bunch of puzzles and that's going to solve that problem. We use the game to ask what is diversity? What is inclusion? What does it mean to students? What does it mean to faculty? What does it mean to members of the university community? And so in a way, the game was more about problem finding than it was about problem solving. Um, so anyway, that's, that's just to give you a sense of what our orientation is. We can say more about that uh, in the Q&A. Um, at this point, if you can shut off the camera just for a second, that would be great. So we have plenty of time for Q&A. Um, feel free to ask questions about any part of this process. Yep. So you mentioned funding. How did you get the funding <laughs> and what, how much were we talking about here? I'm thinking, okay, if I want to do this in my school, what can I go back doing? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was hard. Like, I think that, um, we got you know, a chunk of money from the Neubauer Collegium, which funds interdisciplinary faculty projects, um, but that was a one-time source, so like it wasn't ever going to be sustainable that we could do that again. Um, I mean, I think once the college, you know, John Boyer, Dean Boyer was a big advocate of this, and so he was willing to put in some resources. I mean, he was very helpful. In fact, I would say, you know, for those of you who know Dean Boyer, he's a very creative person. So we pitched it to him and he was like, great, let's do it. And the rest of the staff were like, wait, what? What is this? And he's like, it'll be fine. And then we were sort of like, well, it might not be fine. Like, you know, we don't really know, like, if it's going to work. And he was like, well, try it. Like, that's what we do here. Um, and in fact, we, you know, we originally pitched it for doing a small subset of the incoming class, like maybe 200 or 300 students so we could have like a full control. 
And he immediately, and we didn't even know if he was going to let us do that. And he just, you know, he was very quiet, asked a lot of questions for like 45 minutes. And then we basically asked, like, can we have 200 students to try this on? And he looked at us and said, no, you can have the entire class. Which we were like, oh, we <laughs> that's like not what we thought was going to happen. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that, um, you know, with ARGs, I think you can scale them to, to adjust the price. But, I mean, at least $200,000, right? I mean, I think because we needed, like, uh, I mean, building the book, book sculptures, hiring artists, like, you know, the puzzle designs and things like that, paying students. Um, and so, I mean, I think it's, this is like the downside is like it is hard to fund, right? I mean, there's a, not a lot of outside for, like right. places that are like, oh, this sounds like a great <laughs> intervention to fund. And so right now, you know, we have our hopes hanging on the National Endowment of the Humanities. But um, it, just, it just depends on your topic, right? I mean, so like the first three games that I worked on, super cheap, but like also meant that like two people were working full time to make those work. Those were largely online. Um, this got funded through an arts uh, thing, the Gray Center. The Source and Seed both got funded through, uh, one of them was the NSF, one of them was the MacArthur Foundation. The Parasite got this new bar funding, now we're going for the NEH. So we're going all over the map in terms of like the disciplines and trying to get money um, for this kind of thing. And, and Kristen's right, it doesn't, it doesn't quite fit into any single discipline or even two or three disciplines, which is what excites us so much about this, <laughs> right? I mean, it seems to be like another model for thinking through education, but it also means that the pitch, no matter how tight, is gonna seem more diffuse than something that is a kind of N plus one intervention. Yeah. But this can be done in many different yeah. scales of funding. I mean, we just, we went all out in terms of like the team that we had working on this. We had mus musicians, we had <laughs> like computer scientists, we had, I mean it was partially also like an experiment in like what can the University of Chicago do with transdisciplinarity, but, um, but like I said, I mean the source seed, all of these other projects were cheaper. I mean I think we'll look back on the parasite, you know, five years from now and be like, wow, we really just like threw everything at the wall. <laughs> We're like, what happens yeah. if we do all this stuff? But I think it was useful that, you know, one of the things we learned was we could have done probably more online stuff because that was really, you know, in the summer, in the focus groups, the students were like, all I did in the summer was work and think, what's college gonna be like? You know, so like that was a time in which they really like, liked having something to do. Once they got to campus, there was a lot of things competing with their attention, you know, and so I think we could have done more online stuff, say, which would have been cheaper than building book sculptures, but that was cool, so, <laughs> yes? So then this was a one-time program in 2017? Or? Yeah. We did not repeat it this year. We're hoping to repeat it next year. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we did wonder if, because we didn't do it this year, if everyone was looking for it. So that it became an ARG on its own, where everyone's like, is that a rabbit hole? Is that a rabbit hole? <laughs> yeah. um, so it could have like generated something like that for the first years already. Um, but yeah, we definitely needed a year to kind of step back and be like, well, what did we do? You know, and to figure out the money. I mean, it really is just, I mean, this is something that Patrick and I are doing as a research project and the university has been gracious at, you know, letting us do this here, but it's not like their project to fund. So that's really on us. So, so I, I want to kind of piggyback on that. When you do it again, you can do the same or you're going to have to tweak it or rewrite it completely or just? It'll be a totally different narrative. Yeah, th these are, I mean, these were some of the, the, the mood boards for the, the costumes and the, the things, you know, totally different colors. Yeah, so no secret costumes, society. No secret society, <laughs> yeah. no masks. 100% different. Yeah. So how do you assess whether it was successful or not? I mean, I think that, you know, success in terms of getting people to engage and, you know, make friends before they got here, I would say it was definitely successful. If we look at who played and who didn't play, um, you know, students who were less likely to play were athletes. And I think a lot of that is that they come a month in advance. And so they already have their community. So they're not necessarily like looking for other parts. Um, and people who are really drawn to being in fraternities and sororities, which again is another kind of um, community where you can kind of get in there and have friends sort of automatically, right? Um, also in focus groups, we had, you know, someone who described himself as an econ snake who was like, I came here to make money. <laughs> so like, I don't care about what the orientation was. So, I mean, it's not going to get everybody. You know, and so I think it's more that we wanted the people who felt the most alienated in the climate survey to feel like they had a world because other people were like already having these worlds for themselves. An assessment is an interesting thing, right? I mean, if you're assessing the effectiveness of a pill, it's very easy to have like a perfect control for that, right? And kind of assess how effective it is among a certain population. For something like this, it's like less a single intervention than like 150 interventions 
like that are part of a platform. And so these kinds of focus groups, interviews, surveys, I mean, these are things that we can keep doing to get a sense of the effectiveness of all of this. Uh, but beyond a certain point, right? I mean, it's like, like you're, not, you're not writing a book or creating a film or something, you're, you're producing this world. And everybody who went through it had a very, very different experience of it. And that's partially the point, right? I mean, that I think is the strength over this kind of intervention over a traditional lecture format or something, which is very common in orientation and in fact in teaching nationwide. Right. And I, I would wonder about, say, for instance, retention rates and things like that. You get students who are right. involved already in the summer, you know, you're more likely Right, so we thought about doing, um, part of why we wanted a control group was that we'd be able to like look at the people who played it and have more of an assessment. And so right now, all we could basically do is compare 2017 against 2016, but it's not really like a great comparison, particularly because 2016 was the year that the college sent out the safe spaces letter, which like yeah. was the worst control year because it wasn't like just a typical year. So it was a year that had a lot of buzz around it in a way. Um, but you know, retention is a bad metric here because we have very low attrition yep. um, among, yeah. And so it wouldn't really be that. It would be, um, we're about to do another climate survey. The university will be. And I think that that'll be the sort of measure. Like, are there people who feel, you know, do you see like, did the needle shift at all in terms of like how people are feeling about, you know, feeling as part of the university? But it's, yeah, if we can, could have had the control group, me as the social scientist would have loved that. But, you know, we did what we could do. Knowing that the group is so open, do you know if there was a window for the other groups outside of the orientation group that you're asking? There, there was a little bit. So in this next game that we're working on, we're going to actively encourage that, um, partially because we're applying to um, a granting organization that requires that, but it's also a good idea. Um, in this case, yeah, there were, there were people, you know, there were graduate students here. There was like an MIT professor <laughs> who started playing it from afar, like the online part of it. Like we would get these emails from people on the outside discovering elements of it, partly because we were using social media. So like months before the game started, we had this Red Monk sightings at UChicago Facebook page. And every few days, um, a photo would go up of a red monk somewhere on, on campus and people started joining this. I mean, there's a fairly large community and eventually we would just like let a red monk go for like five or 10 minutes and make sure there was an escape plan and, and people would get their own photos and send it into the site, right? So we kind of, at first it was staged and then it was only partially staged. Um, and when the game took off, people were able to go back and see that there was this long history of Facebook posts. So like that created the sense of worldness even beyond the campus at that particular moment. We had a great one that John Boyer let us stage with him where he looks like he's disciplining the red monks and that someone had secretly taken the picture. So it was great. Um, but yeah, this in the new version, you know, not only like students of other like, you know, cohorts, but we're also going to actively be engaging people who aren't students, right? So we're trying to get like an online community as well. Uh, because part of this will be about like thinking about, you know, creative solutions to climate change and having a pitch session at the end, you know, and anyone could be part of that, right? Um, so yeah, we're excited about sort of broadening it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, back there. No, that's a great question. Um, you know, like I've done a lot of game design both with cooperation and competition. And I find that in my past experience, like minimal healthy competition can go a long way as long as it isn't the core of the experience. So in the coming experience, there's still gonna be a lot of cooperative gameplay. Like all the online stuff, still gonna be 100% cooperative where either everybody gets it or they don't. But we do wanna introduce one small unit because there are students that we lost, not necessarily the athletes or the, or people who went into frats and sororities, but there were other groups that I think reported to us that they would have been more likely to play if there had been a prize, if there had been competition. And of course I said like, I have massive problems with gamification, right? I I think it's, it's like the worst form of kind of like operant conditioning and, and behavior modification. I don't want to do that. But I, I find like, for instance, like the quest challenge uh, that students engaged in, the, the kind of like athletics challenge. People There's one thing during orientation that's like an athletics challenge yeah. um, that, you know, a surprising number of students participate in. Yeah. And a lot of it is about the rewards at the end. Yeah. And so there are prizes for that. 
Um, and so, you know, like uh, we're imagining one unit out of three units to have some degree of competition, but again, in a really playful way. And we'll assess it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But I think, like, for me, um, I feel like I'm too biased against competition. And so I want to try it experimentally, see if it works. And if it doesn't, like, my preferences are confirmed. And if it does work, maybe there's something to it. Do you ever uh, be trying to do this, like, every year for every organization? So, I mean, I think the problem is, you know, again, that this is like a research project that we're doing. And, um, you know, I think that there's some. I think the university would be interested if we could make like module forms that anyone could do. Right now it really like relies on like the labor of like <laughs> the small group of faculty that are like, I want to do this. And it's a lot of work, you know, and I think, I don't think either one of us would have done this before tenure. Um, you know, it's like a project that it would be the equivalent to writing a book, but doesn't really have that kind of metric in the world. Um, and I think we both just happen to be like weird enough that we're like, this is awesome that the university is letting us do this, right? But it does take a lot of work. And I think that, um, you know, I'm concerned about taking the charisma out of it, right? I think if you make it something that like just sort of happens with orientation all the time and it's sort of out of the control of the designers, I don't think it would be successful, right? Like I, don't, I think it's something that could be done poorly, <laughs> like very easily. So yeah. it's hard. I mean, there's a mechanism in place now that would allow us to do it probably on an annual basis if the next one works. That yeah. wouldn't necessarily involve the two of us every single time. Just because enough of a design community has been formed around this and like media arts and design is a new minor at the university. There's a new space opening soon. Um, and there's somebody who's in charge of a new game studio that we're going to have there who could potentially become a project manager for something like this. But I agree with everything that Kristen said. I mean, I think like from an artistic standpoint and from a research standpoint, like, you know, at a certain point, like, you don't want to do the same thing. You want to do the same thing like two or three times because you want to see, like, generalizability is not the right word, but you want some degree of repetition just to be able to compare. But beyond a certain point, we want to do something that, like, hopefully blows people's minds in a different way, you know, like, like a different kind of artistic project, a different kind of educational intervention. But we really do think that orientation is a great time to try this out. You know, like I think it's like a fun time to get to like a nice introduction to like what I think is a really unique and interesting setting at the University of Chicago. Yeah, did you have a question? Um, yeah. yeah, as, as um, different types of polarization might keep incoming students off of social media, is there any intention to build platforms as like the hosting costs and like the upscale time prohibitive? Like, so, yeah. So, so, so Hosting isn't a problem. We've done that before. So for the source game, we created our own platform. I don't think it's a particularly effect. Like having done this that twice, I don't think it works as well, unfortunately, as like proprietary social media. And I agree, people will go off of certain social media, but will probably gravitate toward others. So I prefer a kind of like proliferation strategy where you throw out like 15 different entry points and then assess in real time which two of those 15 are getting used the most, lock down the other 13, and just focus on the two that are working. So it's like a real time experiment. I mean, your idea is a good one, and it's and it's one that like we tried twice and it just doesn't, it's really hard to get people to commit to something that they're not already committed to when they're doing 30 other things, basically. So this is, uh, this is also why we call it the game the parasite, right? We were being parasitical. I mean, we call it parasite for like 30 other reasons that I won't go into, but like we were being parasitical on existing platforms. I just found like myself there on a one-off thought that, you know, just from the work world and in human resources, I mean, a very virtual consulting firm because everybody can work in every state and they can live in every state. And it's just something that I thought, gosh, it would be kind of neat to try to connect. You know, the idea yeah. that like, they never, until we have a one here, you know, they get together and say, wow, I work for a real company. Because they're, right. So it's just a comment, just a thought of how you can extend some of this to other areas where you try to connect people. Yeah, and, absolutely. I think it is really effective for that versus like, you know, the typical sort of trust exercises. <laughs> the, like, we can choose, like, this is you like. You don't have that ability. And they're, you know, they're software folks. And software yeah. Folks are, you know, yeah. And I think, you know, solving the puzzles was really fun because some of them, like, you know, like you would need people with really different skills. So like you would like some of the puzzles, it would be like you'd have to understand like, you know, poetic measure to be like, oh, I think it's this, you know, or you could read like, you know, Chinese characters or you could, you know, understood mathematic formulas. And so like they would really like get to see the different skills that their classmates had and be like, wow, this is really cool that you have this or someone else would be able to figure out something that everyone else was stuck on. And so it was like really cool to see them having to have really like different skills to work together. Yeah, they can move away from, you know, even the work world moving away from focusing on where your weaknesses and how to make up 
better because you just never get better in it. So <laughs> this is a way to kind of pull out where your new you know, your new employees are coming in, where their strengths are, and you know, you can yeah. see some of that. Yeah. Know, about. I mean, I mean, this is like a design thought too that we had, right? Is is like after having made a bunch of these, like you create like different episodes essentially where like different people can stand up as leaders, right? So like like rarely can one person dominate the entire process. Uh, I mean, some people might try, but it, but it, but you know, you like you bring them in and out of uh, attention, I guess, and so it really does distribute things really nicely. It's a good way of designing for cooperation too, where it doesn't like make cooperation optional and makes it utterly necessary if you want to complete the game. Did you talk about hazing? You said something about it and then it was in the video. And I was like, why, yep. why is that in the video? Um, and that's kind of like a half thought related to a broader thought of, um, if I set out to design something to make people feel less isolated or less alienated in the Iron Tower, I don't know that I would have went for secret societies <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, the skull right. and stuff, right? right. right. So like, well, like, that seems like an interesting yes. knot of things. So can you just that's exactly why we did it, right? So like when you're making something like this where you can't tell them that it's a game, you have to play on their subconscious and non-conscious knowledge of genre, mm -hmm. right? And part of a genre that everybody knows in one way or another is a secret society or skull and bones if you're in the United States or things like that. And that usually maps onto elitism, hierarchy, hazing, and any of these groups that are secret societies are basically engaging in the work of self-reproduction. Right, like I'm going to do something horrible to you because it was done to me last year, basically. This is the insane logic of these groups. And so our design challenge at the very beginning was like, well, could you imagine a group that is kind of like that but doesn't engage in any of those structures? So instead of self-reproduction, can there be a group that is committed to self-obsolescence? The idea that I'm going to commit to a process that may make me as a particular person with my identity obsolete by the end of it but would be better for the world in some way. And that's a very different way of thinking. That's a very different logic than what a lot of these, uh, these um, f you know, oftentimes fraternities or secret societies engage in. So it's a way both of like capturing genre knowledge and then flipping it on its head. Because sometimes the best pedagogy, right, is to make someone experience something and then give them the distance from the thing they just experienced rather than just saying X is bad, which is not very persuasive. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and the communities that were formed, like with those Facebook pages and people making YouTube videos and that like 70 page document, do you have a sense of whether those communities have kind of like continued? Like, are those pages still active? Like, stuff like that. I mean, there are people in the room who might know better, <laughs> better than we do for that last question. Um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, it, it was a kind of relational process. Like, we had some graduate students and undergraduate students working on the project who were really. Uh, committed to the incoming students, and so a lot of it was just forming one-on-one -on -one relationships uh, with the incoming students and um, encouraging that kind of production. But I also think it's like when people would create a really amazing thing, and as Kristen was saying, share it on the group me, other people would not only want to compliment them, but add their own pieces to that as well. Um, I mean, the kind of core group of players um, it has kept in touch. Yeah. I mean, I still see them hanging out together sometimes when I'm walking out of the reg or something. Um, but in terms of like, and you know, and I know somebody else has been working on a kind of extension, small extension of this game. Because basically at the end we said, look, this secret society is now yours, basically. Like, I mean, we're going to do our own next game, but the next game is not going to be like Parasite 2.0. It's, you know, maybe it'll connect to the world in some small way, but that's about it. And I think that, um, you know, in terms of like, I think the friendships persisted. I think it also, like when we think about, like I don't really think about success, I think about impact. And I do think that it, um, like so I've had several of the students in my classes now, and I know Patrick has, uh, the grad students who are part of it, like one who I know, you know, like the students felt really excited to like see her on campus. Like in fact, in the focus groups, one of them said, you know, if I had trouble on campus, I think I would like contact her first because I think she would help me, right? And I mean, one thing that we learned that I think we thought we were going to have to lure students into like some of the events, like they had to go talk to a faculty person. So like there was one where like you had to deliver a pizza to a professor who was waiting in your office, waiting in their office and you had to eat with them. So it was like demystifying faculty. And it turned out that that was really popular. Like we were like, oh, no one's gonna wanna do this. And so like what we learned was like, it really did create this kind of intergenerational contact too in sense of like, there's like people on campus who've been here longer than I have, some grads, you know, undergrads, grad students, faculty, and like 
I could like go to them if something happened. And I think it was kind of, you know, it was nice for people. Um, and I think you know, the grad students who were teaching classes, you know, <laughs> got these students who were taking classes with them. And I think, you know, my guess, I, my memory is that the core group of students contained a lot of people who were probably going to be more in the sciences, but that this brought them into the humanities like a little bit, right? That then like it created this idea of like, oh, like this is what you can also do like with the liberal arts. In this process, I mean, the things working out and not working out at different moments, like we really, like I, I can't over, like we showed you a series of things that we did. That was a drop in the bucket. I mean, we were on a daily basis, you know, I mean, we were working for like, eight, 16 hours a day. I mean, it was like you were throwing everything at the wall knowing that 50% of it wasn't going to work. That was the method, right? Like overproduce, move through every possible medium, see what attracts people, see what doesn't, and know that you're gonna do this again and you're gonna do it in a tighter, more streamlined fashion. But it's like, this was like, like an ur experiment in terms of like media and learning outcomes and stuff like that. I mean, it also meant that like many of us, again, came out of this like super exhausted, but also had all of this data and not just like focus group data, which is really, really valuable, but also just the experiential design data of having made this thing. Yeah. Is the green letters there a radical? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a. <laughs> it, it's actually uh, yes. your game, right? You're one of your games. I, I mean, I actually think I understand. I mean, there's, there's a typo, too, so I don't I, 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 You never know what's a rabbit like, hole. Well, early, early on Saturday morning, you know. Yeah. So, it's being a new game, and it's about students being engaged in each other in the game. It must be a real moving target because um, students change. So, if you, you, you said you chew everything and you saw what stuck, but you, then it's an act of imagination to imagine what might stick with a whole new totally. group when the media is moving so fast. Well. Yeah, when, yeah, like when I did this like three years ago, like or five years ago, we weren't using Snapchat, right? And we were using totally using Snapchat for one of the puzzles in this last thing. I mean, that's just like a technology example. But then also, you know, we had a dance party in Logan as one of our eleven events in here. And I remember we like crowdsourced the question of like what song is going to bring the most people here given the age of the students, and like just basically did an, a, an informal survey and like totally got it right. Yeah, it was kind of hilarious. Where it was like <laughs> a song that like would have been popular when they were all in junior high, right, or something, and it like really like mobilized everyone. But I also think that this is why we work with undergraduates and graduate students as designers as well, right? And so I think that, um, you know, we're working with people who aren't that many years ahead, right, and can kind of help us tap into what's going on and what's going to work and what doesn't work. I have um, grandchildren who are going to be looking at colleges before too long. I can see telling, going and telling them about this presentation I saw and how exciting this was, that that could be a lure to this college, you know, to this university to say, oh, wouldn't that be cool to be part of that experience? Do you see that as an incentive to the University of Chicago? So we hope you tell Dean Robertson and, and Dean Boyer that, first of all, uh, you know, like not, not just us, but thank you. Um, yeah, you, you know, I mean, we, we absolutely do. And, you know, both Chris and I have had experiences being at other places, either for our sabbaticals or just giving talks in other places, uh, you know, among them Vanderbilt, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, and hearing, you know, telling people small pieces of this and them getting really excited and being like, oh, we wish we had something like this but they don't. Right, and I think that like, you know, I feel really proud of the university, you know, I love the University of Chicago and I love its sort of like quirkiness and I love our students. And I think like it really is something that works well here because, you know, the students are kind of fearless. I mean, this is a place that, you know, in the focus groups, when I asked people like, were you deciding between other schools and how did you pick here? You know, for everybody, it was, this is one of the last places that really emphasizes the liberal arts, right? And so even though I think I'm gonna be a chemist, I want to be sure that I'm taking like humanities classes and I think it you know it gives us a, a like I think the students who would be attracted to it would be happy here you know, because I think it really is something that we felt like kind of tapped into the sort of ethos of the University of Chicago with like the scav you know the scavenger hunt culture and like just a lot of different things about about the University of Chicago um, and so you know I do think that it could be a lure I mean I think that it, I mean my understanding is that Dean Boyer saw that right away and like 
other people in the you know upper echelons were like, oh, I don't know what this is. But then once it was done, you know, like a big story came out about it in Wired, and I think you know the university was really proud of it. I think. And then you know we kept the book exhibits up, the installs, which were really cool um, during Parent Weekend. And so that also did a lot of it. That the parents came and they wanted to see it because their kids had been posting pictures on social media of this weird room full of like book sculptures. And so then they were like, "This is so cool! I can't believe you built this like for our kids." And you know, so I think that that really like did a lot too. That the parents felt really excited that like my kid got this cool experience that was like really just made for them. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you. I just didn't want to...